a big thank you to Queen Air Asia and um, all the town students on um, behalf of the Muslim class uh, for this wonderful opportunity to share some information and experience about the charging infrastructure deployment experience from Taiwan. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, in the next, I think, 20 minutes, I'll be um, trying to go through these a few topics and especially in the next slide, you can see very well. Uh, um, next slide, please. So um, I think this is not, not, not similar to many of you, just because I think countries in Southeast Asia, I think we all share the same kind of movement or uh, sort of travel behaviors. And particularly in, in Taiwan, I think um, we call it scooters. I think it's also called a like moped or um, also two wheelers in many parts of the world. But somehow it's not just a, a form of transport, a mode of transport. It, it's, it's a business model, it's used for logistics, and it's a family car, and it's a fashion icon, as you can see here. It's multifunctional, multi purpose. Um, but that creates, has been creating a lot of problems especially from this uh, model split in Taiwan, as you can see that a scooter is the main mode of, almost the main of mode of transport, accounts for 45.2% of the trips taken overall, uh, followed by private vehicles. So electrifying scooters has become, uh, I would say on top of the agenda for a really long time and the Chinese government actually has been thinking about that, but then in the next few slides, I'll be talking through a few setbacks and the reason why it's not really happening as is expected. Next slide, please. So given the amount of um, scooters on the streets, um, 20, 12 points, uh, almost like 12 to 30% of the uh, national total emissions actually comes from uh, the uh, transport sectors and the road transport because of Taiwan is sort of an, an island itself and the major mode of transport is definitely road transport uh, as a domestic, major domestic way of moving around. So 95.57% uh, of the uh, transport emissions comes from the road transport. So decarbonizing the transport sector, especially the road transport sector is paramount in Taiwan. Uh, next slide, please. And as you can see here, the, the number of private vehicles, the number of scooters, uh, despite an early kind of success in, 20, in 2013, 14, you can see there's a gradual increase in the past few years. And the number of cars and scooters owned by a hundred population has never been uh, going down um, anywhere. And so you can see that the number is not really um, changing too much in terms of uh, decarbonizing the transport or to, to shifting from fossil fuel vehicles to electric vehicles. Next slide, please. So um, uh, the reason that it's, it's I mean, I'm, I'm coming from more like a governance and policy perspective. I think there are, um, I, I have been in the, in the uh, past two hours, I think I've been blown away by all the um, knowledge and information about uh, the electric vehicles, the batteries. I think I have learned a lot as well. And what I can possibly contribute to the conversation or the exchange here is, is from a, a policy and governance perspective. Um, so I think back in, in time, back in 2017, um, the national government actually announced a few phase out policies um, to, to get fully, to, uh, to get the government fleets and also scooters and cars uh, fully electrified in 2030, 2035 and 2040. I think that was, uh, definitely a good suggestion and there was a good intention. That was a, a really visionary decisions. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so could you go back to the slide, please? Yeah, so it's announced in 2017, but you turned in 2019, as we called um, in Taiwan, it's a hairpin pen. And it's a really technical term for any um, U turn, any reverse policy reversal is called hairpin pen. Um, for many reasons, because of the change of the government and because of the change of the role of a few political figureheads, they've decided not to um, press on the uh, decarbonization or, or electrification of vehicles uh, for the fear that there might be policy, other policymakers or stakeholders that would be 
uh, affected by the uh, drastic improvement or drastic development of electric vehicles. Next slide, please. So I think alongside this so-called hairpin, um, hairpin turn, I think the subsidy program have not been really helpful. Um, I think initially in 2017, 2018, uh, there were a few really uh, progressive e-mobility subsidy programs uh, for private cars and scooters. However, I think because of the pressure from other stakeholders, in particular the IC industry and also the conventional scooter um, supply chain, uh, the, the government took a different approach as to uh, subsidizing, um, subsidizing the, the, the gasoline power scooters along with or in this in parallel to electric scooters in 2020 and 2021, as you can see on the right hand side that there was uh, actually a surge of the sale of gasoline power scooters in 20, uh, starting from 2020. And you can see there is actually a decreasing trend uh, in 2017, 2018, that people tend to uh, jump on the back wagon of the subsidy program to get uh, the new scooters as clean as possible. However, I think this subsidy program actually has hampered that goodwill, that good policy. And that's why I think the uptake of electric scooters and electric vehicles is relatively slow still in Taiwan. The next slide, please. So the authority, I think, have learned the hard, the lesson the hard way from 2019, 2020, 2021. And now they um, have gone all out to set forth a few uh, plans in the future by um, sort of pan out the future, the subsidies program for both vehicles and charging facilities and to update their building regulations and fire safety regulations and to align all the standardization, installation and maintenance guidelines and case books and then to release the parking lots or public uh, properties for the possibility of installing charging position, charging poles and stations in public properties. And here, I think you can see that the role of national agencies is quite, uh, I, I mean, I mean silo-ish, uh, simply because uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs is put in charge of anything about industry, about standardization, environmental protection, is put in charge to subsidize the, uh, the electric vehicles and charging facilities, interiors. Uh, Ministry of the Interior is in charge of building codes and fire safety regulation. And it's, it's, I think you could tell, like, for the national government, it's all about regulatory frameworks, policy frameworks. Next slide, please. However, I think when it has to happen now at the local level, because however many subsidies programs we have, however uh, many uh, sort of regulations, guidebooks, guidelines, and case studies we have at the national level, things have to happen on the ground. So there are a few cities that are relatively uh, keen on uh, taking up the challenge to electrify their scooters and also vehicles in their jurisdictions. And such is the case I uh, would like to share here is uh, some sort of the strategies and action plans um, taken by the Taichung city government. They have this public sector leads the way, private sector follows up approach for the public sector to send out the good signal, uh, the clear signal for the private sector to chip in and to do the collaboration with the public sector. Um, in terms of the charging spots, stakeholder engagement, a battery swapping system, and charging facility subsidies. Next slide, please. So the way I have been categorizing this is particular slide, interestingly, I would say is to not from the policy regulatory framework, but it, it's all based on the actions and the strategies, because it's how local governments use to communicate with the stakeholders. They set forth the regulations very clearly, um, such as the existing national policies and that how they could use the low emission city ordinance to override things that are still lacking at the national level, such as the extra subsidies program, and to bring in extra stakeholders. And space-wise, we all know that charging stations need, or any charging poles need some extra space. Whether or not it's a good idea, that's another story for another day. But in the city center, I think very proudly populated or densely populated areas such as cities in Taiwan, find space for 
for charging facilities uh, has always been very challenging. So all local government agencies chip in to, uh, to find that available spaces for the transformation of the uh, electrification of the, uh, the vehicles or the infrastructures as well. So here we see the parking, uh, public parking facilities are uh, biracial transformed into charging facilities or charging spaces. They also encourage the, uh, the private business premises or public, um, I would say the uh, housing complex to set up their own committee and to provide charging facilities for their employees, for residents, and um, possibly can open their charging facilities to the public. And incentives-wise, I think along with uh, the subsidies program from the national government, local governments also um, have established or um, pan out a few incentives to encourage public sectors to install charging stations and also to encourage the installation of uh, charging spots in housing complexes by relaxing, loose, loosening up the building codes and regulations. The next slide, please. So if I may spare just a few uh, minutes to explain this, I think um, even though I would say um, the electrification of the vehicles in Taiwan has never been a smooth sail and we are learning the correct way, the hard way, I think, uh, it was a bit of a setback frustration for a few years, but we are uh, ramping up and we are scaling up the strategies. So uh, what I am sharing right now is not really set in stone yet because um, they're still doing by learning, but somehow I think here the EV charging station operations were put in the center stage. It's very important because uh, they do have the technologies and they understand the policies, they understand the customers and the EV makers. So they are, uh, they are the putting the driver's seat um, to collaborate on the left-hand side public tenders with the owners, even sale food stations and uh, individuals, public fleets, also public developers, how they can actually work in collaboration to, with the EV marker uh, makers to provide information about charging uh, information and with the e EV owners to streamline the software, the app to make payment easy, to make information more available and more accurate, and to give that confidence to release and to relieve the range of anxiety and charging anxieties to the EV owners, I think, which is quite key. Um, and then they collaborate with the public charging spots through subsidies and through the uh, uh, sort of public private partnership. So on the right hand side, I think. It's it's the it's taking shape. I think the collaboration is taking shape, and with the foundation in place, and they could go out actually now to help all the stakeholders on the left hand side, in yellow boxes, and to set up either through providing spaces of electrification for the charging operators to come in and to set up the uh, technical uh, infrastructure, or they get the direct subcontract uh, from individuals, fleets, or government agencies, so on and so forth. And next slide, please. Yeah, I think uh, this is the last slide I would like to share uh, in the interest of time. I think I think there are still a few issues that need to be resolved urgently, as you can see quite clearly in the first few slides that it's just very silo-minded. We have different agencies at the national level to deal with different subsidies, regulations, guidebooks, codes of conduct and everything. So for a operator, for a uh, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure provider, I think that's really hard for them to understand which document to send to which department or which government agency. So there's a horizontal integration confusion, I, I would say still in place right now at the national level. And that also brings up, has actually been bringing up another question as to but it looks like the, the Ministry of Economic Affairs is taking charge of the electrification of vehicles in terms of and not only the vehicles itself, but also the charging facility per se. But which ministry actually is also in charge of decarbonizing, uh, decarbonization of transport, which is supposed to be the Ministry of Transportation and Communication, but they seem to take a backseat. They are not really being proactive and they have been criticized by the public, by the media. Um, so I think that's something 
at the national level, they need to sort out quite quickly because uh, Taiwan does now also have this net zero emission, uh, net zero, yeah, net zero, net zero 2015 uh, declaration and who is in charge of what the, um, I would say the um, liability is becoming um, more uh, important than ever before. Also, also vertical, vertical integration has been confusing given the fact that there are subsidies program from national government, but also from the local governments, whereas um, the government agencies uh, at the national governments don't really align their policy with the national, uh, the government agencies at the local level. And for even for the same type of subsidies or the same type of um, tasks. And that also has been creating some confusions as well. And spaces and locations, I think um, uh, so far, most of the charging facilities are, uh, are designed in public parking spaces or uh, private parking spaces. And rarely were they so far designed around the curbside, around the on-street parking. And I think uh, also because like it's a scarcity, right, for the urban parking areas, is especially in city center, um, whether that could be uh, used as an add-on to our current charging system, but also how uh, we could better understand the uh, the driver behaviors to so that we can install the right type of charging uh, poles at the right space without uh, wasting uh, the resources, wasting the uh, public money. And finally, I think um, policy varies between cities to city in this early stage, even in Taiwan. Cities uh, that are the forerunners are putting together their resources, whereas uh, cities they are a little bit rural or regions are a little bit rural. They still have to look up to those cities to understand how they can mobilize their resources or even capacity. Some of their uh, employees don't really understand emergency that much. Um, last but not least, I think there is still a call for uh, some official guidelines, not just about technical case books and rule books, but also how the best in terms of a policy white paper and policy guidelines for cities in Taiwan to know who are the stakeholders they need to bring to the table and how the best deploy uh, immobility. Uh, anything about the ecosystem without, uh, again, just repeating the mistakes the national governments uh, made back in 2019, 2020. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, I think that's all. I hope I was not really overrunning, but thank you very much.